Bill Hurd from Hackaday. Today we're going to be talking about analog to digital converters. Let's get started. Analog to digital conversion, as the name sounds, where we're converting an analog signal to digital, to something the processor can read and understand and, and manipulate, it all, is all about sensing the environment. It's about, uh, you know, is it time to shut the chicken coop doors because it's raining? What's the voltage? What's the temperature? And these days with the, the prevalence of all these microcontrollers, uh, they're just made for uh, analog to digital conversion, ADC we call it. We don't bring out all of the signals that used to be part of a microprocessor, the data lines, the address lines. We don't have to. There's enough internal memory to run your program, so that leaves the pins available for ADCs or just general purpose I.O. lines. So uh, we're going to talk more about uh, the different kinds of analog to digital converters. I can't get to them all. There is a bunch, but we're going to talk about the three main kinds and uh, their, their trade-offs, which are basically resolution, how many bits, how much do you know about uh, that thing you're trying to measure, uh, the speed at which you do it, are we doing it like my fluke meter here four times a second, or are we doing it at radar speeds or video speeds, and then the cost, you can, going fast or going deep, you know, going fast or going big in resolution, comes with costs associated with it, and complexity, but it's mostly about cost. Here's a handy little chart showing the four most prevalent ADC architectures. Uh, one being dual slope, this is where a capacitor is involved and there's integration going on and uh, you'll see that in digital instrumentation, your fluke meter, etc. Sigma delta, which we're not going to talk about today, it's, it's a half digital, half analog technique and I, I could do an entire video just on it, I think. Successive approximation, you'll find this a lot of times in your little controllers uh, and whatnot. Uh, it's cheap and it's kind of right in the middle here where we've got a resolution in our throughput and then flash Which sounds fast. Well look where it is. It's up in the high throughput speeds uh, But it's limited in resolution and so let me show you more about flash Here's a simple diagram of what's in a flash converter and it's a string of comparators. I'm only showing three here, but for eight bits of binary, there would be 256 of these. And the way the resistors are stacked together, each comparator is looking for a voltage or will activate on a voltage slightly higher than the one above it. Now, when we do ADC, you know, even though the world is full of magnetism and, and, and light and those kind of things, at, typically we end up converting that to a voltage. So I'm going to be talking mostly about voltage here today. So here's a voltage that comes in and goes to the, every comparator, and then the other terminal on each comparator sees a slightly greater voltage. This happens pretty much all at once. Then when this voltage comes in, these comparators will all make a decision about the same time, hence flash. So the only time constraint is the time it takes from, for it to get from the input through to the output. Now, we do tend to clock this a little bit. Rather than just let it keep racing through here, we might put a uh, sample and hold, and I'll talk about those more later, in the front of it, and then I'll synchronize this so that I don't read it right as the, the bits are changing. That's bad. We like to be synchronous when we grab our bits out of a device. If we look at, uh, at ADC in general, what we're doing is creating a digital value to represent an analog value. And here's a sine wave in red, and here's just a 3-bit. And you can see that that doesn't look much like a sine wave. Uh, we can tell the frequency, we can tell some things from it, but it's, it won't sound like a sine wave if you were to play that back. Here we see more bits, and here you see it looking more like a sine wave. And I'll tell you that everywhere that you see this deviation between the red and the blue, that's a certain amount of noise, that, and that appears right on the signal. If this was an audio signal, you'd hear, uh, it's called quantization noise, you'd hear everything from a <laughs> noise to that weird hollow rumbling that you get like on Skype and, and other things where the bandwidth is very low. And down here we can see that. Here we're showing the samples. And by the way, the more often we sample, the better it will sound. And there's a criteria called Nyquist criteria where to just tell the frequency that we're listening for, if this was all the same, just an even sine wave, you need at least twice that frequency just to make sure that you know that frequency, that you, you picked it up 
and saw the transition from high to low to high again. If you go too slow, you might see high, 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 and that's because you didn't sample it when it was low. However, if you only sample it at twice the frequency, it's not going to sound real good either. So we call it oversampling. Uh, you'll see it on like DVD player, MP3, all that. You'll see oversampling. We're talking about how many little slices we put in here. So we get errors from these discrete steps, but we also get errors from how often we sample it. And here they actually try and show that little red wiggle there is the error that comes from uh, the sampling time. So every time it deviates, see we're in the two, we're in the green and the yellow split, that's a deviation. So flash converter. Now, I, I used to use these in video all the time. Love them, right? Uh, the problem is you, you, 8 bits, there's 256 comparators. 9 bits, there's 512 com comparators. 10 bits, it's up to 1,000. And, and, and the resistors that go with it, and a lot of times they, they used to have to laser trim these. Um, nowadays, they might have the process good enough that these track, but they may need a laser trim them. So it gets frightfully expensive real quick. So we don't typically, by the time, if you look even in DigiKey, you get to the 10-bit converters and they've jumped to $100 uh, up from like 10. Now, a priority encoder, if you're familiar with an address decoder, where you give it three address lines and it'll make like eight different single outputs, a priority encoder is the opposite of that. It takes eight single outputs and tries to tell you the three-bit version. In, in priority just means it tells you the highest version it sees. That's all this is doing is, is taking all these discrete inputs and giving you a binary value for the highest value it sees. SAR, Successive Approximation Register. And this is a technique that actually uses a digital to analog converter, the opposite of analog to digital, and it compares a value written by the processor or some logic to the analog input and as it tries to get closer and closer to it until at last it says, hey, that's so close, I've uh, approximated what that is to whatever bits, and you can go quite high in these. This is the most common one in the little microcontrollers and things built in. Uh, you might even see where it says four aided, aided Cs. Really what it is is they mux it. So you have four inputs to the same analog to digital converter, and a lot of times that's an SAR. So the way this works is at first it does the most significant bit, and it outputs that. And it basically cuts the voltage in half, and it says, is it higher than this or less than this? Then it puts out the next one, which cuts it another fourth, and it says, hey, higher or lower, and it goes right on through that. So I'm going to show you that in a simulation using Excel, and then I'm going to show you on the bench because it's kind of cool to watch. Now, during this time where it's trying these bits, the analog can't be squiggling around. If you measured it and you said, are you greater than or less than half, and in the meantime it goes from greater to less than, uh, it'll screw everything up. So we have what's called a sample and hold in front of these almost always. And a sample and hold is quite simply something like where we let the voltage onto a capacitor and then open it, and forgetting for a moment that this cap will start drooping and discharging, and there's ways to prevent that. It just holds it during the entire uh, conversion process. So that's what a sample and hold does. Let me show you a simulation of this thing as it hunts for the voltage. Okay, follow me on this. It's actually uh, quite simple once you see it. What I'm doing, though, first off, is I'm referencing, uh, I'm typing in input voltages as they compare to our 5-volt reference, which I've chosen just as a standard. And what does that mean if it were an 8-bit word? So 2.5 volts is half of 5, so that'd be a uh, 128, all right? So the way successive approximation works is it will try first the most significant bit, D7, and he says, he, he puts it out in that DAC and he compares to it. And he says, are you greater than 128? And in this case, when it's read, he says no, and we put a zero here. Okay, now had the value, had it been slightly above 128, he would have put a 1 here and said yes, and he remembers that. And then on the next one he says, well, are you greater than 128 plus 64? And again, that's the red, and he says, no, this time I'm not, and he puts a 0. And then he goes, well, are you greater than 128 plus 32? And, and down till he gets to, bang, he hits one all the way down here. Where he says, ah, okay, I'm, I'm, you can leave that one added in, and it punts till it gets right down to the value, in this case, 133. That's the value for here. So if I were to give it 0.3 volts, 
you'd see it hunt down and then start hunting back up. Now this takes eight clock cycles to do, but it takes the same amount of time every time. For eight eight uh, uh, eight bit SAR, it takes eight clock cycles. If I go way up high and I say four point eight volts, you'll see it. It hunts all the way up till it finally runs off the top, and then he squiggles around till he gets it as close as he can, and he gets a two forty six. So this is this actually works in time from left to right, and we're going to see that on the bench now. But this is just an Excel spreadsheet I wrote that helps you visualize this this uh, hunting process. Here's an SAR that I built out of basic pieces to show you uh, the innards of it in action. And again, this is what you might find inside a chip, only not all big and blown out like this, but this way we can look at the signals. So if you remember the block diagram, we started with a, a piece of logic to control it. We have a digital to analog converter. We have a comparator, and those are right here. Here's my control logic. I could have used my Hackaday Pro Trinket if I wanted to and written it in code. I just happened to write it in FPGA. Here is my digital to analog converter. Remember the R2R ladder that we did for DDS? Uh, well, here it is again. It's just some resistors hanging off an I.O. port, and I'm making my own digital to analog converter for almost nothing. And then I have little LEDs to show you which port is active and, and latched and which one's on. And then I just have one of my little modules here as a comparator. Remember the simulation I showed? What happens is it first tries the most significant bit and keeps going downwards, and meanwhile it's latching the state of whether it was greater than or less than. Uh, the test value. So uh, if I lower the voltage that's going into this, we'll see that the most significant bit stops being latched. There, now it's down into the the lesser digits as we go. And if I show you the output of the digital to analog converter, you can see it hunt now for that one volt that I'm giving it. And finally, here's what it looks like on the scope. Now I'm running this real slow. Normally this would be zipping along at thousands of, of cycles per second, uh, but I've slowed it down here so that we can see it. But watch, the blue line is the reference voltage, and watch it seek out uh, using SAR. And our last one today is the dual slope conversion uh, analog to digital converter. I used to use this in instrumentation. Uh, I used to get like 18 to 20 bits out of it if we did everything very careful and just right. Quite simply, what happens is you couple, you first you switch to the input voltage you want to measure, and it integrates it. So it starts to charge up a capacitor, but because it's inside an op amp, we get a straight line, not an RC. And we don't know how long this will take because we don't know the different sizes. This is a small voltage, here's a big voltage example. But then we switch it to a reference voltage that we do know, and we time how long it takes to discharge it. Now, this uh, uh, also cancels out all kinds of effects that happen. Uh, you know, there's some things like the dielectric absorption of the capacitor used to be um, something we'd have to watch because it'd cause an error when you jumped from one direction to the other. That difference between the two was lost in the uh, capacitor itself. Here's a little circuit I made for the TC7109, which is a single chip dual slope converter. Uh, you know, you'll find these things in things like handheld instrumentation or whatnot, but this one's got a microprocessor uh, interface. That's why there's so many pins on it as opposed to like an SPI or something that's got a parallel interface. But if we look at the scope, here's where I was talking earlier where it charges uh, based on the input voltage. And let me change the input voltage. I'll show you. All right. And the square wave at the top I'm just using for a trigger, but also indicates how long the conversion cycle is from start to finish. So there's two phases. It integrate the unknown voltage, which is what I'm changing, and that's the, uh, the slope going down. And then the discharge, which is the return to the baseline. And actually, if you look, the discharge occurs at the same rate all the time, and it's that, at that time that we count. And because we're, uh, you know, testing it by, by the discharge of the reference, we're actually canceling out gain, pro gain shifts and even some offsets and stuff. And again, then, the time between these conversions is an auto zero phase. 
So what you don't see here is a massive amount of pulses that gets counted during the VREF time. And let me show you one last thing here about uh, how to count just tons of pulses, uh, for example, coming out of one of these. Finally, I wanted to show a trick for counting uh, lots of fast pulses. Uh, where you, you don't have to count each and every pulse, but at the end of the day, you still get the same precision as if you did. And quite simply, you put the pulses into a divide by n counter. Let's say uh, it's a 16 bit counter, so every 65,000 pulses, you get an interrupt. Maybe this goes to the counter directly in your processor or controller. And uh, so you get only one pulse that you have to count representing you know, uh, 16 bits. At the end of that, though, then there's an amount left in this counter, and what you do is you grab an I.O. port, put it into here, and then you keep toggling until you get one last overflow, and you subtract that, and that's how many pulses happened throughout the time, was all of these interrupts plus the amount left in the counter. So I, I want to show you a, a combination of many of the things we've talked about here on the videos here at Hackaday into a single product. This is an analog section that I did for a digital scale uh, back in 1982. It was good for 18 to 20 bits. It used a dual slope building block, and here's our polypropylene cap to cut down on dielectric absorption. Uh, and this did our dual slope conversion that we just went over. Up here is an instrumentation amplifier made by three separate amplifiers, the OP07s made by PMI, who are no longer with us, Precision Monolithic. And then here is a low-pass filter. Uh, we've talked about those. And here is the front-end switches where uh, it would look at a pre precision resistor network. We would buy all three resistors at the same time, matched each other where we would uh, look at the signal, then we would look at a gain, we'd look at the signal, and we'd look at a zero, and then we would do the math to cancel all that out. And we use a low side switch, we've talked about high side switches, to disconnect the capacitors when we are jumping this around, so that the capacitors were in there for our Chevy Chev filter and our low pass filter, our, our real pull filter, um, during the uh, signal phase, but when we went to look at all these different gain values to correct for, we'd cut out the caps suddenly because they had a long time constant. So uh, here's everything that we've talked about. This was a hand tape board, hand taped by a, a friend of mine, Terry Fisher, of Fisher PCB. This, this would still work today, it's just we can do it a lot smaller. This whole front end with the gain and zero reference checking is now done inside instrumentation amps. Here's the zero drift instrumentation amp we talked about in the past, which is chopper stabilized, and that's essentially what this was doing. Uh, other than that, it's, it's uh, still viable today. There are some other aspects to A to D's we'll get into later. Uh, basically, how do you have digital circuitry? Uh, live next to analog circuitry and not become noisy from the digital. So there's always some isolation there to keep one side out of the other. And those techniques are actually done in here, um, and perhaps we'll show them at a later time. That's it for uh, this video. I took the time to build a couple circuits because I really wanted you to see the, uh, the innards and see get an intuitive feel for how some of this works. Uh, you know, as they say, a picture is worth uh, 1,024 words. So... Bill Heard from Hackaday, and uh, we'll catch you on the next one.